Now turn to part one. Part one. A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course which lasts for two days. Okay. Or there's the four-day beginner's course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginner's course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is $190. The beginner's course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is $320. No, sorry, $330. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is $430. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you $12 a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, OK? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of... Care of Mr and Mrs MacDonald. Like the hamburgers? <laughs> yes, exactly. MacDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box 676, Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. OK, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's OK. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh, wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose, and clothes suitable for an active day in the hills, preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. 
Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way we'd save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> Uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams, and I really do need to study. Okay, then. Let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know... If That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here's our reporter, Vincent Freed, who's on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. Well, here I am, standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. The technology behind the car's 6.9-litre engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. In an age when 160 kilometers per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour and could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25, and 27. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. 
Onto another celebrity, the 1922 Leia Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Leia, who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The Leia very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The layers were used regularly in France in the 1920s and were even produced in saloon and van form as well as two-seater. The layer matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird. This extraordinary car was first... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear a trainee teacher called Eve talking to her university tutor about her preparations for teaching practice. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Eve. Come in and sit down. How's it going? Fine, thanks. I'm looking forward to my teaching practice next week. Good. Now, you've got two classes, haven't you? Year 3 and Year 6. Have you done your lesson plans? Well, I've decided to take the topic of renewable energy. I haven't done a lesson plan for Year 6 yet, but I thought I'd base their lesson on an example of very simple technology. So, I've brought this diagram to show you. I got it from the internet. Let's see. A biogas plant. So, this is equipment for producing fuel from organic waste? Yes. The smaller container on the left is where you put the waste you've collected. Right. And from there, it's piped into the larger tank. That's right. And that's slurry on the base of the larger tank. Right. And what exactly is slurry? It's a mixture of organic waste and water. So, is that pipe at the bottom where the water comes in? Yes, it is. As the slurry mixture digests, it produces gas, and that rises to the top of the dome. Then, when it's needed, it can be piped off for use as fuel in homes or factories. It's very simple. I suppose there's some kind of safety valve to prevent pressure buildup? That's the overflow tank. That container on the right. As the slurry expands, some of it flows into that, and then once some of the gas has been piped off, the slurry level goes down again, and the overflow tank empties again. I see. Well, I think that's suitably simple for the age level it's for. I look forward to seeing the whole lesson plan. Thanks. And can I show you my idea for the Year 3 lesson? Of course. Let's look. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. I thought I'd introduce the topic by writing the word energy on the board and reinforcing the spelling and the pronunciation. Then I'll do a little mime, you know, run on the spot or something, to convey the sense. I'd keep it brief at this stage. Yes, I will. Then I'll wipe the word off and write the question, where does energy come from? 
and see what the pupils come up with. Fine. I'd suggest that you just brainstorm at this stage and don't reject any of their suggestions. Yes, that's what I was going to do. Then I've produced a set of simple statements like energy makes cars move along the road and energy makes our bodies grow. There are eight altogether. Are you going to give them out as a handout or write them up on the board? First I'll put them up on the board and then I'll read them out loud. And I'll get the pupils to copy them out in their notebooks. I'll also ask them to think up one more similar statement by themselves and add it to the list. Good idea. After that, I thought I'd vary things a bit by sticking some pictures up. Of things like the sun and plants and food and petrol and a running child. And I'll get the pupils to work out what order the pictures should come in, in terms of the energy chain. I think that's a very good idea. You could move the pictures around as the pupils give you directions. Yes, I think they'd enjoy that. And to finish off, I've made a gap fill exercise to give out. They'll be doing that individually, and while they're writing, I'll walk round and check their work. Good. And have you worked out the timing of all that? It'll probably take you right through to the end of the lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen, and answer questions 31 to 40. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. Don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ, that is, directly from the water, while swimming? In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water. Ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, 
but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward than you would think. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down underwater. But a crucial factor is that the diver has to keep the water moving, so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill, and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, um, lady... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Describe an invention that is useful in daily life. One invention that is incredibly useful in daily life is the automobile, commonly known as cars. Cars are a mode of transportation that revolutionized the way people travel and have become an integral part of modern society. Cars are designed to transport individuals and goods efficiently from one place to another. The primary function of cars is to provide convenient and fast transportation. They allow individuals to commute to work, travel long distances, run errands, and explore new places. With cars, people can save time and have greater flexibility in their daily routines. Additionally, cars provide a sense of independence and freedom.
as they offer the convenience of traveling whenever and wherever desired. Cars are widely popular around the world. They have become a common sight in both urban and rural areas. The popularity of cars is evident from the sheer number of vehicles on the roads and the continuous advancements in the automotive industry. Cars cater to diverse needs and preferences, ranging from compact city cars to luxurious sedans and SUVs, ensuring there is a car for every lifestyle and budget. In terms of usability, Cars are designed to be user-friendly. Modern cars are equipped with advanced technologies and features that enhance comfort, safety, and convenience. From automatic transmissions and power steering to navigation systems and infotainment, cars offer a range of features that make driving easier and more enjoyable. Cars are useful for several reasons. Firstly, they provide a faster and more efficient means